Today on Rambling About Cars, Sayonara STI, Sayonara V12 Vantage, well, sort of Sayonara there. We need to stop saying goodbye, so hello to a new Audi station wagon that's coming. And we also drive the new Honda Civic. We've talked about it a lot, and by we, I mean one person on this podcast has at least driven the Civic. So without further ado, it is podcast time. I'm Christopher Smith, and give it up for Mr. Chris Bruce. Hi, everybody. Um, as always, like, subscribe, follow, whatever it is on the service you're listening to us at. Please do that thing. And now let's get into the show with that perfunctory bit out of the way. Um, let's start with the death of the STI brand or death of the WRX STI. Because that was a bummer. It came out late Friday. Like, I think I had already signed off on Friday when this news Everybody happened. had signed off. And I was going through. I mean, here's a little bit of inside baseball for folks not in the media world that's that goes for cars anything you don't make big announcements on monday because everybody's still pissed off that it's monday you don't make big announcements on friday because everybody's thinking about getting the hell out for the weekend so your main news comes tuesday wednesday thursday so here we are it's it's i mean it's like late afternoon friday I'm in mountain time, mountain daylight time now. Thank you, daylight savings time. The East Coast crew had already checked out. It's Friday afternoon. This is kind of like just coast a long time. Nothing big is going to come out. And then I see this statement from Subaru pop up about STI. And it's like, okay, well, this is interesting. And yeah, the, the statement was like two paragraphs long. That was it. And the statement, uh, I mean, I don't have the statement in front of me, but the crux of it was, yes, we see that electrification. There's lots of things happening in the industry. As a result, we're not going to have an internal combustion WRX STI for this generation. Just like period, flat out. And it kind of, I mean, it's it's a bombshell. It's a straight up bombshell, right? Because we had been hearing rumors, Bruce, um, about okay what's the next gen sti gonna be like um i mean we heard rumors of what like 345 350 horsepower some mm-hmm. rumors were even saying up to 400 and and they weren't just kind of floating in midair i mean there there were some grounds behind it all and then when subaru brought out the new wrx and it had four more horsepower than the outgoing gen it's like well Okay, that seems a little weak, and we were a little critical on the podcast about the Rex. Um, And if I remember correctly, I was actually maybe a little bit of the voice of reason there saying, well, it doesn't necessarily need a bunch of power because they're saving room for the STI. And beyond that, forget the rumors, everybody. Subaru took a freaking STI concept to Tokyo Auto Salon just a couple months ago. And everybody was expecting, okay, well, that's going to be the, you know, the next STI. They're giving us a little bit of a preview here with this, with this um, S4 STI concept. So, yeah, when this news broke last Friday, a week ago, as you're listening to this, that's just flat out, no, no STI for this generation. And they were a little cagey on whether a WRX STI would return at all. If it does it won't be just an internal combustion, you know, right. Rip rip snorting rally car. It'll have some form of electrification. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that, that's where we stand. Um, So I have got the statement pulled up here and I counted it's five sentences. So five sentences, I'm just going to read the whole thing to people (laughs) because that's all there is to it. As the automotive marketplace continues to move towards electrification, Subaru is focused on how our future sports and performance cars should evolve to meet the needs of the changing marketplace and the regulations and requirements for greenhouse gases, zero emission vehicles, and corporate average fuel economy. As part of that effort, Subaru Subaru Corporation is exploring opportunities for the next generation Subaru WRX 
WRX STI, including electrification. In the meantime, a next generation internal combustion engine WRX STI will not be produced upon the new WRX platform. The Subaru WRX STI and STI brand represent the zenith of Subaru's performance vehicles, exemplifying Subaru's unique DNA and rally heritage. As we look to the future, we also look forward to incorporating the essence of STI into our next generation of vehicles. So there you have it. Um, not shutting the door on performance, obviously. Sure. Um, it's very, I mean, it's straight up. It's very easy to make an electric performance car. So unless you are just diehard set on on the wastegate and the brrr and all of the good stuff that comes with the, uh, you know, with, with the rally cars, with a little turbocharged four-cylinder engines, there will be some performance, but it's not going to be as it was. And and the article I wrote um, accurately, I believe, Subaru WRX STI dead as we know it. Um, yeah, because if it, yeah, if it does come back, that statement that is entirely fair. Um, uh, and just uh, this week now, actually, before I jump into that, that that came out like like I said late on Friday, and. I was like, okay, I need to talk to somebody at Subaru about this because we had all of the rumors. Obviously, Subaru isn't going to comment on rumors, uh, but then we had an STI concept just a couple months ago. It's like, was this the plan all along, or did somebody somewhere along the line at Subaru just say, well, you know what? We're going to have to change course. Let's just pull the plug on whatever we have. I wonder if there is a next generation WRX STI sitting somewhere in Japan that's never going to see the light of day. So I was trying to get a hold of Subaru. Um, and to their credit, I did manage to get a hold of a Subaru rep late on Friday, which I thought was heroic. So thank you very yeah. much for that, Subaru. Because their press um, office, we should say, is in New Jersey. So it was just yeah. as late for them as it was for us. It was, I mean, it was technically after closing time. Um, when I got a response back from them, um, and I was, I mean, I was trying to be diplomatic. I, I, I was trying to be diplomatic and, and, you know, expressing, Hey, I, I'm not just a reporter. I'm, I'm a fan of these cars. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you give me some context on where this sudden decision came from? You know, how did this come about? Is, is this, um, just you know, based on something recent, or was this always in the plan? And unfortunately, I, I couldn't get any comment. Um, but we did learn something a little bit earlier this week. Um, uh, the colleagues over at Road and Track um, they had a chance to talk with somebody at Subaru. Still, not the answer I was looking for, but the crux of that was um, it just didn't make sense for Subaru to do it. It would have such a short shelf life because of changing regulations, right? Um, which, I, I mean, I guess that makes sense. Changing regulations in Europe as far as low emission, zero emission, the, the, the Euro 6 rules. If you think about it, an STI might, what, be a, a year away from the regular WRX. Usually, so now we're, yeah. So now we're stepping into Eight 2023. Months. Um, 2024, 2025, that's when you're going to see those tighter emissions regs really starting to come in. So, I mean, they're thinking, okay, we're going to do an STI for a couple of years before it really gets clamped down. I mean, I just, I, I feel like there's so much more to the story that we don't know. And I would love to learn it someday because yeah. truthfully, I am a fan. I've had, um, I've had a couple of Subarus over the years the older legacies. I was a huge, huge fan of Colin McRae and like that first gen legacy. I had a first gen legacy turbo and I envisioned myself being Colin McRae and that ended just in a big pile of rust. But I mean, it, it's, it's sad. This is, this was last Friday for me was a legit sad day because I mean, that's, I'm a huge rally fan. The WRX is at least still around, but a lot of people would argue that it's kind of lost its direction. The STI was always the, okay, the no nonsense. Let's really go out and have some fun road going rally car. That's gone. 
And of course, everybody started talking about the Lancer Evo and that being gone. And it's just like, oh, I was just crying in my beer that night, Bruce. So I should say what if you're watching on YouTube, um, you can see that we're the gallery I put up that we're kind of going through is the WRX with the STI WRX S209. And if if you're familiar with that vehicle, Subaru actually created their own STI sub brand because it was so different from the WRX and the STI that was available that it was they considered it a whole different car. Mm -hmm. And it was incredibly limited here in the United States. And I just wonder the prices of those things are going to skyrocket on the aftermarket oh because it's yes. almost like uh, the 993 Porsche where it was the last of the air cooled where this is now as far as all indications from the company suggest this is the last true STI that is going to exist. The, and the I just imagine last, that like yep. anyone who bought one of those is just you know, you're going to sell it for the asking price and then some all day long for years to come. Well, I mean, just look at the Lancer Evo when that went mm -hmm. away. The values on like, that last generation, especially the last couple of years of the Evo before it went away, they're not going anywhere. They never even really came down that much. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll see the same thing here. You'll see the same thing here. And uh, I mean... It was, it was good, Bruce, that you mentioned the uh, the STI had its own brand because it's important to keep in mind we're talking about the WRX STI, uh, but Subaru at Tokyo Auto Salon gave us a pretty big preview of electrification coming in the performance realm with their uh, the H what is it the one thousand seventy three horsepower STI. E R a concept. It's a mouthful to say, and it's just a design concept, uh, but I can get that shared up here in a moment. It's a, uh, okay, Bruce, you already beat me to it again. <laughs> it's, I mean, like I said, it's, it's not hard to make a lot of power with electrification. So STI, I mean, there's, there's still a future for STI. Um, yes. So I mean, I guess we can take some take some solace there, but uh, yeah, I mean, no more turbo, no more turbo four cylinder. Well, we could still have a turbo four. Well, I don't know, you know, maybe a turbo four cylinder with a plug in hybrid, you know, driving the rear wheels. Maybe this is just me totally spitballing, and it's driving the front wheels. But I mean, think about it. Think about the last time you and I were talking about Subaru, and that was with the BZ four X. Or I'm sorry, that's the Toyota version, the Saltera. Sorry. Yeah, same thing. Uh, yeah. Um, but they're moving in a different direction because they have to, because that's the way automakers have to go. And mm -hmm. we are seeing these, you know, I don't really want to call it a legacy product. We are seeing these kind of iconic performance products from these brands going away because they have to go away. Um, and it's just, we're living in changing times and for better or worse. Like the thing is, is that, you and I have talked about this. There's nothing wrong with EVs, but you still, you feel this twinge of, you feel this twinge of loss when you find out, oh, there's not going to be another WRX STI. And from kind of what we hear, the WRX is going to become a hybrid after this current generation that just mm -hmm. debuted. Like this is the end of the road for non-electrically assisted WRX, whatever from Subaru, mm -hmm. like that's the way they're going. And that's the way everyone is going. And so, right. And kind of have to, we have to accept this transition, even if we don't love it. Right. And uh, I mean, you're certainly not wrong there. Everybody knew this was coming. Um, I was going through some of the comments on that article. Um, and there was one that really stood out to me in particular where the person was like, man, I, I mean, I knew that this was eventually going to happen, I just thought there was going to be one more generation before it did. Mm -hmm. And and that person, if I remember correctly, that commenter, they were they were thinking about buying an STI and they were going to wait for the next generation. And now they're like, damn, you know, this this is this kind of hurts. So mm -hmm. now you're going to have to go out and try to find, you know, a, a current STI. If there's if there's still one new sitting on a lot somewhere or pick up something used, it's um. It's it's not I guess that it happened. It's that it just it just came out of freaking nowhere, man. Yeah, I mean it, yeah. it was it was it was like just the blindest of the blind shots, and that's what I mean. That's the story that I really want to know about Subaru. I 
I really want to know what you know what's going on there. Did they that's already the have it in the story pipeline? You, you get know? 10 years from now when you're at an LA auto show or something like that, and you're sitting down yep. with press people or execs or engineers, and maybe they have a drink in them and they, you know, let things loose. That's when you get to find those things out. Yep. Or um, even maybe a little bit longer when when you're doing research on writing the book for yeah. this for the history of the Subaru WRX. Yeah. And you find out just how close we came to a 2023 Subaru WRX STI with 400 horsepower, right? And that's that's when you that's when you learn, okay, you know, they had a couple prototypes and they they were doing testing and everything was approved and then maybe one person, you know, a higher up executive or, or maybe it was a group that came in and said, uh, you know what? we're not going to have the budget to do this or we have to choose between this or a version of the Solterra. Mm -hmm. So goodbye STI. Hello, Solterra. Oh, and it just makes the performance enthusiasts in all of us kind of tear up just a little bit, but let's do, let's transition to somewhat happier news. And that is let's do the new, the Audi a six Avant e-tron concept. How about that? Okay. Okay. Because that's something that we're gaining and it's, and it's, it looks like it's going to be cool. Well, tentatively. And I will explain why as as we go through. Um, so, and this, and this is fresh news. Just, um, I mean, this vehicle is literally debuting as we're recording this on, on our Wednesday, when we usually record, this yep. vehicle has literally debuted like <laughs> like a half hour ago, forty five minutes ago. Yeah, and uh, and and Bruce was on it just right. just like nothing. So tell us all well, about. So it. So I wrote up the the embargo release for it, and I also covered. Um, so more and more, just peek behind the curtain. Automakers, because of COVID, they are not flying people to various events. They're doing virtual events where, you know. Uh, uh, when I sat in on the Audi one, they said earlier in the day they talked to Chinese media, and now they were talking to North American and South American media for when I was on. Just mm. and that's just the way it went, goes. But uh, so this is the concept for the Audi A6 Avant, fully electric version. That's e-tron is um, Audi's name for that, and this they are saying is going to be very, very similar to the production version, um, the vehicle that we're looking at here. Uh, what's his name? Josef Schlossmacher, who is the head of communications of product and technology at Audi. He said a production version is coming in 2024. He didn't, I'll get to this in a second. It's not clear right now whether the United States is going to get this vehicle. Um, oh, I'll just come out and say it. When, we asked, better. Dur- when asked during the, the press conference, they said, never say never. And then they said maybe a future RS version might, but they're not sure about this one. Now, granted, this is a vehicle that's not coming out until 2024, and a lot of things can happen mm-hmm. before then. But so never say never is the official response from Audi regarding whether we're going to get this in the United States. And we can't um, we can't blame them. Let's be honest. American yeah. American buyers are not interested in station wagons. They're interested in crossovers and SUVs. Um, and Audi took a big leap in bringing the RS six Avant over here. Mm -hmm. Um, of course it's a high priced wagon, but those of us who love this sort of thing, I mean, it's, I would love to see it Audi. If if you want to bring it over here, I'd love to see it. I know I'm in, I'm in the minority on that, but it's electric. I mean, it's not like you have to go through a bunch of steps for emissions regs in different areas. Um, the crash standards should be the same so rough just, i mean once you build it for europe bring it just, to the u.s it's just put it on hard. a boat and ship it over Ooh, maybe 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 you want to put it on a plane and fly it over maybe maybe too soon to start talking about putting audis on electric audis on boats and sending it over anyway <laughs> okay. um so i think this thing looks fantastic <laughs> personally so i should be clear the audi only showed the exterior of this concept they were clear that the concept does not have an interior so all the okay. images that we're going to see are only the exterior but i think it looks really nice i the front end i think is probably the most polarizing aspect you see it in some of the pictures and it's just kind of i guess the best word i would say is gratuitous like there's just a lot going on it's kind of busy 
but there's some neat stuff, for example. So the headlights that are ultra slim, they're also super high tech. They're using a new version of Audi's, um, uh, the, what do they call it? Ultra matrix, something matrix where, um, uh, uh, owners are going to be able to program in their own, uh, daytime running light signatures. So if there's a certain shape you like, you can put it in there. And they also described that at least on the concept, and it's not clear whether this is going to be on the production version, but while you're charging it, if you're pulled up against a wall, you're going to be able to use the headlights to play video games against the wall with the passenger, (laughs) or I guess by yourself. So I just, I mean, the headlights are high tech, but I don't expect you're going to be able to play like Mario brothers, but like pong or something like that, with that seems realistic. And that's weird and kind of wonderful and kind of fun. And that yeah. that raises a whole new idea for me, plugging like actual projectors into headlights, you know, like you, like you might have like a, you know, projector in your house that, sure. that, that you can plug in your computer, or whatever to project up onto a wall. I mean, the technology is already there in the lights. Just, just set it up so you can just project stuff. I mean, make your own freaking drive-in movie or something, you know? Yeah, but the headlights, keep in mind, it, they really only do two colors. They do the illumination color and the turn signals. So adding RGB is a whole nother thing. But you're right. Uh, you, if you, you can, can already project stuff, adding a little bit more doesn't seem that crazy. I, um, I, bet, I bet you could do it. And yeah, I agree with you, Bruce. I think it looks great. The front... Um, I mean, front holy speed. chin. There's there's a chin on that thing. Depending on the angle you look at it. Yeah, there's it a just, lot it just at looks, the front. It just looks like a big chin. I know, Bruce, you were talking earlier in chat. You were asking about the back. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because uh, the back is is very interesting with the the way they designed, I guess, it's it's vents on either side. That, is that? No, that, that, that is sort dark. of, that, that, that could resemble exhaust. Outlet. They kind of, oh, here we okay. So here, there this image here that we're looking at. So you can see it has these big. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to describe it verbally as best as I can. But uh, the the bottom portion of the rear has two big silver portions that look like a diffuser, and right. inside of those silver portions, right below them, are oval shaped vents. And when you look at them at first, it kind of looks like exhaust outlets. Obviously, they're not. It's a full EV. I'm not saying that. They are exhaust outlets, but it kind of evokes that look. And I like it. It gives it kind of, a, I guess, a traditionally aggressive look at the back. Um, I dig it, personally. Smith, what do you think? I mean, I like it. Um, I, I'm, I'm such a nerd. I would, like, find some really bright neon blue strip lights to put, <laughs> it, to put in there and then, like, wire it in so... Anytime the throttle goes wide open, they light up bright neon blue. That would look cool. Just to, yeah. hey, check out check out my thrusters in my Audi wagon. But and then while we're looking at the back, I'm it weird. has a full width strip LED. And the LEDs inside of that, it's hard to see in the image we're looking at now. But they have a 3D kind of effect to them. So, um, but so yeah, they basically look more complicated than just a flat LED. And this is this is an A6 Avant e-tron concept, not an S, not an nope. R. Um, what was the power on this? So twin motors, uh, one at the front, one at the back to give you mm-hmm. all-wheel drive. And you are looking for the twin motor setup. I know it's 459, but I'm trying to look up the torque rating. It's 459 horsepower. Oh, I'm, it's 800 Newton meters. I know that because I wrote 469 horsepower, 590 pound feet of torque uh, from that setup. Which um, that, that's going to make for a plenty fast car. I mean, it's, oh, yeah. not, it, it's not rip your kidneys out fast, but that's going to be still a zero to 60 in like four some seconds. Yes. Um, and they were clear both during the presentation and in the release there is also going to be a rear wheel drive only version, a real rear motor drive only version. And they're saying that version might be able to go as far as 435 miles on a charge. That's in the WLTP, the European testing. So in the US, it's usually a bit less, but that's still a long way to go in a big wagon for an electric vehicle. Yeah, Um, I mean, that's the formula is there. For people that don't want to cross over or an SUV and right. still want to go electric, I mean, there are no other alternatives, right? There's no other yep. choice. 
Well, we're talking specs. I'll do the other ones. Audi said around 100 kilowatt hours in terms of capacity for the battery. They didn't give a specific number. Um, uh, and it can charge at 270 kilowatts, and that's enough to recoup 186 miles after plugging it in for just 10 minutes. Uh, you can go from 5 to 80% state of charge in 25 minutes. So all of those yeah. numbers are good. Like they're, they're good. I tell you, after talking with uh, with Kyle Connor, that was was that last week or the week before? Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago already has been. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, it's given me a new a new way to look at EVs just in in listening to their charging stats because I mean the charging stats sound good, but that's that's going to be optimum charging, and this is going right. to apply to to any EV. Yeah. Um. That, that that's going to apply. Um. Optimum conditions when it's warm. Um. Provided you're at the charger that can that can handle that. So I mean. It all right. still it all still sounds good. Um, I would take not, one. Yeah, not every if, charger if want, is going to. If be they wanted to send me that, one, I'll take one. Oh yeah, that two hundred seventy kilowatts. But you know, assuming you find one, that those are the numbers they're giving. Yep. They always give out the maximum numbers sure. because those are the most impressive numbers. But you know, real sure. real world figures are going to vary. That's now, just the way it is. This is a concept, and we know that it was about this time last year. Audi came out with their just a six e-tron concept. I believe it was April of last year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, so just, uh, just about this time. Um, yep. And now we're seeing spy photos of the production version of that car mm -hmm. out and about now. Um, and that's probably going to debut this year. Do we have any inclination when a production version of this is going to come out? Like I said, uh, the Josef Schlossmacher said 2024. Um. And again, we don't know if that's going to be available in the United States, but production version in 2024. I totally missed that, Bruce. I apologize. No, I probably said it too quickly. Don't worry about it. I, so I, I, I'll be I, honest. I, this is the first time, folks. This is the first time I'm really getting a look at this car. So in theory, if this is the first time you're getting a look at it, I'm right there with you. So Bruce is talking away, and I promise you I'm listening. But I'm no, just looking at the fine, images man. like, oh, damn, that looks good. Okay, no, nice profile shot. Wow, that chin is kind of big. I need to talk about the chin a little bit. Okay, there's the backside. We were talking about the exhaust pores earlier. So, yeah. You're, you're so giving me I, an education with everybody else. No, no, that's fine. So I do want to mention two things that came up during uh, the press conference. They didn't rule out an RS version of this. They didn't completely say, no, it's not going to happen. They didn't rule it out. What they did say was that there was no clear decision, and those are the quotes, no clear decision for an all-road version. So all-road seems like coin flip RS version could happen in the future. I don't know. If, I, if I had to put it another way, I would say RS is more likely than all-road based on what I heard during the press conference. I mean, here's something to consider as we move into the electric era. And this doesn't apply just to Audi, but to everybody. I mean, they're saying, oh, we could make an RS version. I guess my question would be, why not? Because it's not like they have to create a new engine or significantly enhance a current engine so it can handle more power. And then conversely, upgrade a transmission or change a gearbox or, or do all of that extra work. If you want to make the performance version, give it bigger brakes, give it a little more juice to the motors. And that's pretty much it. I mean, I'm not an EV pro. I think it's more or less that simple, right? Folks, if I'm yeah. wrong, podcast and motor one say, Smith, you're a blithering idiot. But I mean, it, it certainly makes the prospect of high performance stuff pretty tantalizing. If it's if it's going to be that much easier. Right. And so the other thing I wanted to mention is this rides on the Volkswagen Group PPE platform that stands for premium. Oh, what's the second P? Premium something. <laughs> oh, premium platform electric. Premium Sorry. platform. OK, PPE. Yeah. And, yep. not, and not personal is, protection equipment. No. <laughs> um, and so that is also going to be underneath. We're pretty sure on this. The, the upcoming the Macan EV. And then they were very clear the upcoming Q6 e-tron will be using this platform and a whole lot of other 
as the premium portion of that suggests, it is going to be for the high end electric vehicles within Volkswagen Group, your Audis, your Porsches. I believe we have a story about Bentley using it. I'm going to look that up and make sure I'm not make, totally making that up. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, as I think more about it and I'm still, I'll be honest, I'm still kind of not drooling over the photos, but they're distracting. They're distracting. And it just has me thinking more about the prospects of performance in the electric era. I mean, how, how easy in theory it should be. And yeah, when, when there's such, when there's such a sharing of platforms going on, it means you can easily inject performance into, into other brands that you wouldn't normally expect. Right. I mean, in theory, I think in theory, yeah, I think anything is possible. Once, you know, uh, Volkswagen group is a huge company with a Mm. hell of a lot of brands, and when they invest, and they have a lot of premium brands, I, you know, you talk about Audi, Porsche, Lamborghini, Bentley, you know, it makes sense for them to develop a platform that any of those brands could use and put their own stamp on. And we're seeing kind of just the beginning of that with the Q or the Q6, the A6 uh, Sportback, the A6 uh, Avant, things like that, that this is kind of the beginning of what's going to come from them. Well, if it's the beginning, I'm looking forward to uh, looking forward to what's to come. Yeah. Uh, how about we d- uh, do Austin Martin next? So we go. Speaking Ilo, of what's Ilo. speaking of what's to come, um, I guess in this case it would be what's to go. We do and have to come. New, come and go. It's it's well it's it's the end of an era, but at least we're yes. getting the era first. And I can share that up here in just a second. We have the new. Aston Martin V12 Vantage that we knew was coming yep. and it's it's finally here and I mean I think it looks fantastic they they've done some body work they didn't just drop a V12 into it they did they did some tweaks to the body they added a bunch of carbon fiber um what it's got carbon fiber hood carbon fiber fenders carbon fiber front bumper carbon fiber trunk carbon fiber rear bumper um, they did that to try to keep weight down because the V12 does add some weight. And oh, by the way, it's also the most powerful Vantage ever. That's a twin turbocharged 5.2 liter V12 making 690 horsepower at 6,500 RPM. I want to, I just want to take a moment and, and highlight that because we've been hearing a lot of, you know, the exotic V12s, high revving. We, we're getting them from Ferrari and Lamborghini that are naturally aspirated. This one, twin turbocharged, it's not quite as high strung. I mean, the 6,500 RPM limit is still... 6,500 is still not too bad. I don't know what the red line is, but... It's it's still not too bad, but I mean, when you compare that to like 8 or 8,500 or something, sure. this this is going to be, I think, a nice streetable car because it also has 555 pound-feet of torque that comes in... I don't know that any car with 690 horsepower we can describe as (laughs) streetable... But but uh, Bruce, I think come that on. might be going a little too far. <laughs> when you, of course, it can be totally streetable. It's got 555 pound feet of torque that starts at 1800 RPM. So that's right. that's lazy power. Low. Yeah, that's you can low. just you can just kind of lay your foot on the gas and bump along. And yeah, if you want to go, you can plant your foot and you'll smoke the tires like crazy and you'll go. And if you get traction, you'll go to 62 miles per hour, zero to 100 kilometers an hour in 3.5 seconds. And if you stay on it, it'll hit 200 miles an hour. Can I tell people the bad news? Yeah. They're making 333 of these. Do you want one? It's too late. They already sold them all. What? Oh, I had like, I mean, I had like a a $1,500 down payment all set up for one of these. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they're already sold okay i'll yeah. i'll i'll throw in an extra 500 i'll put two grand down um, finance finance the rest right, you man. get zero percent right you'll be my co-signer yeah. right i'll yeah i'll co-sign for you but i don't <laughs> i no, suspect it's, uh, 300 of those 333 paid cash and maybe more and, oh yeah yeah and and, yeah. and and with this being i mean this is going to be the last v12 vantage Right. We were talking um, about the S209, the STI S209. This yep. is 
the equivalent in Austin Martin terms. And an Austin Martin is always going to fetch more than a Subaru. And it is what it is. And I remember when I was on a, when I was on a media call with, uh, with Aston Martin CEO, well, it's been what, a couple months ago. I mean, there was some talk about this and this car coming up and talking about the future of the V12. And, and and same thing we were talking about with Subaru is just emissions regulations. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to make it possible. Um, There could be now, and and this is a lot of speculation because this is going on um, that, that conversation that I had with them a couple months ago. I mean, they didn't rule out occasional little, you know, just kind of boutique runs of maybe 10 or 15, some little specialty thing that wouldn't necessarily apply to certain rules and regulations in various countries. Um, but as far as larger production, and I I use that with air quotes because we're talking about 333 of these. It's not like it's going to be, uh, you know, a massive run. Um, yeah. Yeah. End of end of the era where we keep saying this, Bruce, more and more, it feels like. Um, oh, I, I should point out, too. Um, I mean, it's not just some carbon fiber with big horsepower. They upgrade the suspension. They upgrade the brakes. Um, the price, the, the, there was never any mention of price, but it doesn't matter because <laughs> they're already they're not sold, for sale. So, yeah. So, well, you'll see this car for like two million. I'd bring a trailer in a year, right? Um, so real quick, you were talking about future strategy. Um, I wrote up a story. When was this July of 2021? Um, and that was an interview with automotive note, automotive news Europe with, uh, Tobias Mers, who was the CEO of Austin Martin. And he said the plan was 50% of their vehicles, uh, as of 2030 would be battery electric. 45% would be some form of hybrid and the final 5% would be combustion powered, but likely would be track only. So that's kind of their plan moving forward. Um, and yeah. it's, I mean, it, it's, it's all fluid, right? It's all fluid. Yeah. Um, if there's a rich enough guy somewhere willing to spend the money, they're going to build the car. It's just mm-hmm. that they're going to build 333 of them or 30 of them or 10 of them or whatever. Like if you have the money, you can get it. It's just the vast majority of the population do not have the money. And, and since we're talking about money, I mean, I'll, I'll also go ahead and say it. I think Aston Martin is still really looking at just how well their DBX is going to do because the DBX that's going to be like every automaker, large small the suv is going to be the breadwinner so the better i hate to say it the better the dbx does the better the chance we'll see new neat little kind of boutique stuff coming out of aston martin so i guess it's a catch-22 i'm not a huge suv fan but they pay the bills it's kind of hard to argue with that right yeah, it is. It's and it's the same thing with me. Like it pays the bills. It's still, and I know our boss Seth Mearsma d- disagrees with this. So Seth, this you can disagree with me if you want. I still kind of dislike a brand like Ferrari that does have the money and does has no problem selling vehicles, moving into the SUV market, moving into the crossover market, because it feels like more of a cash grab to me. But we know Austin Martin in the recent past has been stra- <laughs> uh, strapped for cash. Yep. And a vehicle like the DBX is going to help them out. Well, I mean, I, but at the same token, Bruce, I, I'll, I'll take the opposite on that. You can't blame an automaker for building the vehicle that people want to buy. Right. I know. So yeah. if, if there are, if there are, if there are people who wants a more everyday vehicle and they want that to be a Ferrari, and Ferrari should an everyday it? Ferrari exist though? Hell yes, it should. Maybe it does. It could be. It could be. It could be any Ferrari. You know, I guess. I guess that's the that's the philosophical debate. You have you have lots of disposable income. So you yeah. say, I I've always wanted a Ferrari. I've always wanted just a really sleek V12 or or twin turbo V8 Ferrari. I can go out and I can afford one and I can have one. And now I can drive that every now and again. Actually, I would kind of like to drive it more than every now and again. I have my everyday vehicle. That's 
a two hundred thousand dollar Bentley because hey, you know we'll we'll just go nice and luxury. What if my everyday vehicle could be another Ferrari? What if I what if I instead of spending two hundred fifty or three hundred, I spend three hundred fifty or four hundred or whatever the Pro Sangue is going to be? I'll get the Ferrari, and now I have my Ferrari experience every day. Right? I mean it's it's not like it's not like yeah. Ferrari's giving it's not like Ferrari's going to make an SUV where the buyer is going to decide, ah, oh, I would really like to have a sports car and an SUV, but I can't afford both. So I'll just afford this one Ferrari. Right. If you're buying the freaking Ferrari, the Pro Sangue, you can afford a second Ferrari. So yeah, yeah. it's not like you're, it's not like you're choosing between the SUV or the fun car. You're just yeah, you choosing your SUV a- to be another fun car, right? Sure. You present a fair argument. I can't argue with that. I, I don't love it, but I get it. Well, I um, I can argue against it. That's that's how crazy I am. Because I no, can say, I can argue against it too. I'm just not going to argue against you. Also, because I want to move into our next topic. <laughs> <laughs> what? Come on! I, I'm not I'm not necessarily trying to pick a fight. Okay. Truth be told, my nose has been itching since we freaking started this podcast, and I'm sitting here like trying not to sneeze, and it's like okay. That's that's getting a little difficult, and I'm gonna do a little shout out to uh to G4 to the Attack of the Show vibe check that I was watching last night because this topic actually came up on a Would You Rather, and it was Would you rather be on the edge of a sneeze your entire life or have hiccups your entire life? Edge of a sneeze. In in case they're listening, I'm speaking from experience right now. I would much rather hiccup than be on the edge of a sneeze because this is just driving me insane. Anyways. Ah, okay I well promise, I, I promise i'm not doing any drugs that's just on the edge of a sneeze so Whew, off the uh frequent listener frequent commenter jonathan brown sent us an email that i want to read and jonathan you wrote a truly rambling email <laughs> i am going to read portions of it because it is a rambling email that should be heard from rambling about cars listeners this is so I'm gonna, this is the best this is the best of rambling about cars right yeah there's here. a lot here i'm gonna pick and choose but so i'll start with the one that i think i'll start with the beginning so uh he we were talking last week about your pinto model that you picked up at walmart and so jonathan said the opal manta was quicker back in the day in showroom stock racing than the pintos and vegas should st- showroom stock racing be brought back or as the idea of racers for motor one uh wait should showroom stock racing be brought back or has the idea of racers for motor one and car and driver forgot about showroom stock racing i haven't forgot about showroom stock i've been to the oh, yeah. the nasa runoffs and the scca runoffs both of which still have showroom stock racing they're, it's a fine thing. It's just not as popular as it once was back in when you had the uh, the neon ACR and stuff like that. But I got no problem with it. It's cool. It's a cool idea. You go buy a vehicle, you take a few things off of it that you're allowed to, and you go racing with it. it that was, I mean, that was the core of NASCAR. That's what NASCAR used to be. Yeah, and, back in the day. Yeah. And I know there are more than a few people, myself included, that would say they need to go back to that because with everything being cookie cutter, Part of, I mean, part of what made NASCAR great was, okay, you have the drivers and then you have the manufacturers trying to innovate and outdo each other. When everything's cookie cutter, you don't have that innovation. Mm -hmm. And, and frankly, it's just not as interesting to watch. And are you familiar I mean, with the neon ACR Smith, the one that they sold that they oh, basically yeah. put the extra parts in the trunk as they sold it to you? And they're like, I love yeah. that car. All I the love stuff that he needs car. right here. <laughs> I, I always keep an eye out in, in case I would put one in my garage if I found oh, one. Oh, I totally would. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Second yeah, part of John. This going. is the part you got into. So, my Econo car challenge would be put more of a focus on durability than fuel efficiency. Inexpensive repairs, if needed at all, would push me towards the frugal GM 3800 uh, V6 from the Pontiac Bonneville or Buick Riviera. These cars are bulletproof and even offered a supercharger if you needed more scoot. I prefer (laughs) bulletproof for a pre-owned economy car more so than ultimate fuel efficiency. I would suggest the fuel efficiency of the overhead valve 3800 V6 in Buicks and Pontiacs was actually really good in the real world. Uh, These were torque monster motors that made their power and torque low down, uh, which really helped Rear wheel, rear, uh, 
real world, sorry, gas mileage mm -hmm. numbers, and they felt peppy as you pressed the gas pedal. Uh, sometimes high ribbing small inline four cylinders did well in EPA or cafe uh, standard fuel economy testing. But in the real world, uh, where the driver could push the uh, pedal down hard to keep up with traffic, gas mileage felt fell quite quickly, whereas the Buick V6 3800 motor gas mileage never dropped because it had all of that low end torque. So big, big, what, big fan of the 3800. I am I, big. Fan. I have not. I actually have driven a vehicle with the 3800. Yeah, it's I see what he's saying. They last forever They're You know, they they are. I, they are extremely durable. They're pretty easy to work on. They're just I mean, just a just just a big overhead valve engine. I've been on the verge of buying supercharged uh, Buick Regal GSs from 90. I think it was 97 to 04. They were they were they were the sleeper to the Pontiac to the Grand Prix GTP because mm -hmm. you saw you saw the GTP that had the supercharged 3800. Everybody kind of knew what that was. They put the same engine on the Buick Regal GS and mm -hmm. they kind of went under the radar. Um, they also had the supercharged 3800. The, the Bonneville too. You could get them. You could get them in some of the Bonnevilles, the Buick Park Avenue Ultra. Yeah. There was a, a used car dealership I worked at when I was going to college. Um, it, it was a pretty decent used car dealer, and the owners uh, they were kind of into cars. They were kind of enthusiasts, and they would always buy these like 92, 93. Uh, you know, like the first the first year the Park Avenue Ultra had. Uh, the supercharged engine on it. it. Maybe it was a little bit later than that um, because they were kind of sleepers too. They were larger cars, mm -hmm. but they weren't painted as performance. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could go out and, and they were, they were pretty peppy for the time. I'll be yeah. honest. I don't, I don't remember the, the fuel economy numbers offhand, um, but yeah, I mean, just right. torque monsters down low. You could just, I mean, you just breathe on the gas and you'd light up. I mean, they were front wheel drive. Just mm -hmm. breathe on the gas and you light up the front tires. And that that wasn't with the supercharged engine. With the supercharger, it was even it was even more. Big fan. And it Good kind call. of goes into what you were saying about the Corvette, the C4 last time, is that once you got a C4 manual in the sixth gear, it got incredible fuel economy because it was running at like it's just idling. 2000 yeah. RPM. Yeah. You'd go down the highway at 70 miles an hour at like 1300 and six gear, just idling along. Top speed in those cars was in fifth. Six was just, I mean, six was just Overdrive. the gear that you could throw it into to uh, to get good fuel economy. So yeah, yeah, lots of ways to lots of ways to eke out some mileage in your car. I'm on I'm uh, on board with this email. Uh, last part, we we got a second, so I might as well read it. So. Uh, the Chinese EVs are coming to fill the void that they're co that the COVID epidemic uh, eventually caused. He's referring to I skip some parts. He's referring to the fact that vehicles since COVID, the prices have gone up highly. Yep. Inexpensive and readily available Chinese imports could destroy our manufacturing base here in America. Is this a rumor, real or bull? I think you're wrong. I have been writing about cars. I I'm pretty sure it's either 11 or 12 years now. I've been hearing Chinese automakers are going to come for ages and it hasn't happened. And if it does happen, it's going to be slow. Uh, real in a several, several decades time, maybe, but I would call it bull. Otherwise, it's just think about how long it took for Japanese cars and then Korean cars to get a foothold that took decades for both of those. And, and, and even, and even then how many of those automakers are now building their cars in the United States? I mean, Hyundai is Honda. Hyundai is. Hyundai is I mean, there, there's a lot of manufacturing going on here. I, I, yeah. I, I, I tend to raise the bull flag on that too. I'm, I'm not the least bit worried about China hurting our manufacturing capability or our manufacturing base. Um, you know, eventually, if anything, they'll come over here and start building cars over here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's, but that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's my take on that. That's, and, and every, you know, when I hear those arguments, um, I'm reminded of a time several years ago, um, my wife was driving our Mazda six and oh, it's, it's a Mazda. It's a Japanese car. But it's made it was in Detroit. <laughs> it was built in Flat Rock, Michigan, by UAW, um, in the same plant where they build the Ford Mustang. And she was getting chewed out by some guy in a, um, in a, uh, I think it was an older Ram that I think it was it was one of the ones they were they, they were building in Mexico. And it's just like, really, dude? 
Yeah. Ah. You know, it, you you kind of had a perfect segue there because the next thing we're going to talk about is so this week I Honda. can't tell. Yeah, this week I can't tell you why, but I just spent a week with a Honda Civic, a 2022 Honda Civic hatchback sport touring that was manufactured in Indiana and had a lot of parts from Ohio. Um, and so, yeah. And so Josiah, if you're listening, this is kind of sort of for you. It had the reason I got the car has nothing to do with you, but you have been sending us emails talking about the civic and the Integra and stuff like we that. We love this. We love the civic, right? We love the new civic. We have nothing, but get, no, that's not, that's not really true. Is it? it we we've been a little, true we've been a little it, critical on the civic. We have been critical on the Civic, and then I drove one, and okay. Let I, well, let me okay, pull let, up let some me, pictures. Let, and... let me let me set you up here, Bruce. Let, let's let's do this the right way because okay, I I have not driven it yet. I will say after the Integra debuted, my view has softened on the Integra. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's really softened on the Civic. I don't think it's a bad car. I just think it was, I just think it's, it's a rather boring kind of lackluster, barely there effort, especially when it comes uh, I, to, okay. I especially when it comes to the SI. So you've driven it, Bruce. What's your take on the, on the new civic now? I, I would accept boring. It, it's not the most exciting car to drive. It is absolutely not lackluster. Um, uh, hold on. I'm trying to pull stuff up as I talk here and that gets complicated. Well, um, well, I guess when you say it's not lackluster, are, are you talking from just like a, a fun standpoint, a comfort I'm talking stand from a standpoint build quality and okay. quietness and all of that standpoint is okay. where I'm coming from. So here is the window sticker for the one I had. So we can all look at it. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to be reading it right now. Okay. So it is a 22 Honda civic with the 1.5 liter turbocharged engine hatchback, uh, the sport touring model, which is the top of the line model. This one, um, it had no, it had everything on it, but no actual like options or accessories. It was just the top level model. So manufacturer suggested real retail price was twenty nine thousand four hundred dollars uh, after um, uh, destination fee thirty thousand four hundred and fifteen dollars. Um, so that's what you need to know. Uh, EPA fuel economy on this from what EPA says, 33 combined, 30 city, 37 highway. And we'll get into that more in just a second. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, $30,000. I actually looked this up just before you and I got online Smith, um, Kelly blue, Kelly blue book as of March 11th, they said the average, uh, sale price of a new car in the United States is $46,085. So by my math, 30 grand is about a third under average. So this is, you know, this is a pretty much less than what the average new car costs. Right, right. And this thing has everything you could want. It has uh, adaptive cruise control, all the blind spot monitoring you could want, uh, brake sensor or uh, collision sensors front and rear when you're in reverse or going forward. It has everything. It has a very nice leather interior. It's not like the soup. It's not like Lexus quality leather, but it's very nice leather. It has heated seats for the um, driver and passenger. It has power seats for the driver and passenger. And I, after, when I first got in it, I didn't like it that much. I drove it just kind of around my block and I was like, eh, I don't know if I would buy this. And then here. Let okay, me pull so, so, so where did that initial impression come from? Because first impressions, they, I mean, they mean something, right? They do, but it's also, to, to explain to the people at home, my the current vehicles in my wife and I's garage, we have a 2006 Mini Cooper. We have a 2012 Subaru Outback. Um, both of those vehicles we like a lot. Uh, we don't, we're not, we're getting close to getting rid of them, but we're not quite there. But it what it just wasn't quite it didn't engage me and i have to say i was just driving around basically my neighborhood and a few other roads it was not kind of a long distance thing and i just i didn't quite feel it 
Um, but as you can see here, so we took uh, the total trip that we took was 323.6 miles. And that went, was basically my home to Columbus, Ohio, to another location, back to Columbus, Ohio, and back to my home. Um, and we did 37 miles per gallon over that course. Uh, what did I say the, uh, the fuel economy was 37, 30, yeah, 37, yeah, 30, 30, 30, 37 30, highway, 37 and highway, 33 was a lot of highway driving, but still, even if you look at that, or there's the image, we basically hit the, the right. fuel economy. Exactly. Like it did fantastic. And I'll tell you, we, um, uh, part of our route is through mostly, 55 mile an hour two lane highways and I filled up right before then and as we came home so this was an 85 mile an hour or 85 mile trip if you're watching on YouTube we got 42.7 miles per gallon according to the uh the fuel economy the trip calculator like this car gets great fuel economy mm. if you drive you know if you don't drive it like you stole it if you drive it right now see it I'm gets- I'm I'm reminded though, Bruce. I mean, that's that that's pretty good. Um, but I'm reminded last year of the trip I took from South Dakota back to Michigan in a new Toyota Camry. Mm-hmm. And I was I was kicking it at like, well, 80 mile an hour speed limits through South Dakota, and I was running the speed limit. Um, 65 mile an hour speed limits through Minnesota. I sort of was running the speed limit. And I was still kicking it in that Camry at like forty-five miles of the gallon. Okay. So I'm yeah. not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not dissing the Civic. Um, I guess. I guess my initial response is, well, it's it's hitting their stats, but it feels like it could be better. Maybe. I. I I'm not going to disagree with that. Um, but and this is and I this is now with. the car. This is the actual car you were driving. Yep, this is, they picked it up today, and I took it just before they picked it up. This was this morning, um, as we are recording right now. And Now, now that looks better than some of the other images I've seen. Yeah, that's the thing. I don't know if it's the color or just... The, just the position that you have in the photo? Well, I've got other photos of the exterior that we, we can look at here. Um, it does look much better in person. The proportions are much better. Um uh, I've got some pictures I, here. I was at the grocery store. And again, this was a sunset image as opposed to a sunrise image. But it looks it's an attractive looking car. It doesn't look nearly as kind of sterile as it does in a lot of the press images. Um, once you see it in person, the proportions are a lot better, especially you can kind of see this kind of long hood. Uh, if you're looking at the images, it it just it's an attractive looking vehicle. Mm-hmm. Um let me get to the issue and I will share this image right now. And for, for anyone watching the person who didn't like it was my dog. <laughs> um, and I'll tell you why Cooper, so he's, Cooper is not impressed. He's like, this is not a car that lives up to my namesake. No. So here's the issue. He has grown up in a Subaru Outback and riding in that. And you can see we, he has a sling that he rides in that kind of keeps him secure. And it was too small for him in the backseat. Um, <laughs> and that's just him as a dog that it's that's not what harsh. he was used to. And he didn't enjoy this vehicle. Re- refresh uh, our viewers. What kind of dog is Cooper again? Cooper is a Corgi. He weighs okay, so, so let's, roughly let's 35 pounds. You're saying the backseat of a Honda Civic is too small for a Corgi. For a spoiled Corgi. Yes. <laughs> uh, And my wife and I actually discussed this, like, Mm -hmm. and we, we had a disagreement about it. To me, if you had one child, this car would be fine. If you were, you know, a couple or a single parent or whatever, and had one, one kid to put in the backseat or even one tween teenager to put in the backseat, you'd be fine. Two is where my wife didn't even think it was quite big enough for one. Two, we both agree is where things would get rough. So it's pretty cramped back there then it it's, sounds it's like. It's pretty it's not you don't have a lot of room back there. But you still get all of those amenities. Like I said, I love the adaptive cruise control. It handled really nice. It's got the steering the steering wasn't overboosted, but it wasn't too heavy either. It felt good. The brakes were fantastic. The 8-way, like I said, this is the nicer version. The 8-way power driver seat was 
one of the most comfortable seats I've sat in. Granted, I haven't driven that much modern stuff, so mea culpa there, but it had, I was able to adjust it both in terms of the backrest. It had thigh supports that were adjustable. It had height that was adjustable. I could get it into a position that was just perfect for me. Um, so as my wife, my wife and I talked about this as we were driving back and we kind of came to the conclusion, this would be a perfect car who, for someone who is looking for something with a lot of the amenities, a lot of the tech, a lot of the leather, a lot of the, it had, is it a 10 speaker? Let me look and see. It's a Bose stereo, but I forget how many speakers. It's either 10 or 12. Um, let's see here. So, so while, while you're looking that up, I'm going to pose the question. 12 speaker. This this particular Civic stickered just over $30,000. Yep. So we know the new Integra will sticker base just over $30,000. Now I'm assuming yep. the base Integra won't have the, the same type. Of, it, it probably won't have the heated seats, the power seats yep. at that, at that level. Um, I don't know if it'll have all of the same driver assists. I know Honda I think has, the Acura watch. I would have, I need to, would have to look at that to be able to tell you it has a lot of them. Yeah. I, I know Honda, Honda, Honda is very good about getting a lot of those safety systems standard, especially once you move now. up to an Acura. Yeah. Um, but at that price, that would be, uh, that would be the more powerful engine with yep. the six speed. You're getting manual. an extra 20 horsepower and I think 15 more pound feet of torque, something like that. Yeah. You're mm-hmm. two. This is 180 and I forget the torque figure versus 200 in the Integra. Um, yeah. And that was an argument that I thought of as well that, okay, so you take the Integra, maybe you lose, you're not, you, maybe the stereo is not quite as good. Maybe you lose out on a few other things, but you get more power. And you get an Acura badge on it, and you know you get slightly different styling. And again, I think it's for the same person. If you if you're not transporting someone in the back seat a lot, I think this would be really good. It's not that you can never transport. Like I'm not saying never, but I feel like someone in the back is going to get cramped. I'm surprised to hear. Um, the critique on the back seats, and maybe it's just because I haven't been paying that much attention. Um, but I mean, I mean, Honda, right. you don't they, have they, kids. I don't have right. kids. I just have a persnickety ass dog. And so <laughs> like, and, and so it, you know, it's a hard call to make it. The, the things that I'm expressing here are my own personal opinions and my own personal experiences with this vehicle. I really liked it. And I want that to be clear. I, this is a really good vehicle. If you don't mind, if you don't mind giving up 20 horsepower versus the SI or the Integra, there's a lot here to like, you get all the tech you could ever want. The infotainment screen, both my wife and I, she was playing around with it while I was driving some and I needed to use it a little bit. It's very responsive. It's very easy to use. We both really liked the, um, their actual knobs and stuff for the HVAC system. There's just a lot to like here. It just it wouldn't fit her and I's situation perfectly. We would need a slightly larger vehicle, but I, I would not dissuade someone from looking at a new Civic, especially in a higher spec like this, because there's not that much I can complain about. Like basically, my only comp- complaint is my dog didn't like it, <laughs> and he's kind of an a hole. So <laughs> no, he's not. Look he at is. him. He's 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 a good little boy. Here's the other so, picture of him, me driving, and him looking at my wife. Like, like why are we here? Like, seriously, why can't we take the other car? Yeah. So, but, so visually speaking, your opinion has gone up on the new Civic. Yes. Yes. I think okay. it is much better looking in person. Do you or do you not think it's kind of a just? A, a halfway effort. It sounds like you think no, they they've they've put some work into it. Or or do you still get that impression that well, they they could I, have done more. They could have done more to make this better. I know. I don't Re- realistically. I do speaking, not, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I do not think it was a halfway effort at all. I think it's a very very good effort, especially in a vehicle that is so significantly less expensive than what the average vehicle costs today. Let me put it: if I was in 
college, if I were a single person, if if it were just me and my wife, this is all we would need because we would be able to. So the other thing is, so we travel to my mother-in-law's in Columbus. And usually when we take our Subaru, we take a large cooler with us because we go to the pla- the food places in Columbus that we like and we load up on food. There was no way with the cargo area with the seats up to allow the dog to be it back there that we could put our big cooler back there. So we had to compromise and we took um, some insulated bags that we have. Okay. But that's not everybody. It, and also if it was just me and my wife, we didn't have a dog or you didn't have kids, you could throw the back seats down and you would still have that room. It's just, I, I want people to understand I'm talking very much in a personal way here. Right. This isn't the perfect vehicle for me. But it is very good for someone out there. I can imagine, like I said, someone who's single, someone who it's just a couple, someone like that. Maybe if you have one little kid, it would be great for all of those people because like the adapt the adaptive cruise, it responded immediately. I did have one issue um, with it that I ran into, and I'll tell you what happened. Um, It was a uh, two lane highway, 55 miles an hour, and it it uh, wide off and the vehicle in front of me slowed down by a lot. And simultaneously, the lane departure warning and the adaptive cruise control kicked in because the why it wasn't sure which way I was going. And because the vehicle in front of me was slowing down, it started to slow down. And so it started to slow down way too much. And so I was down to like. 45 or so and had a vehicle behind me but the re- the response was easy i just put my foot down on the throttle and it sped away and i got through that bit of the corner and it was fine like oh so so you were using driver assists in correct. the manner that you're supposed to use driver assists you weren't in the back seat just hanging out with cooper <laughs> no, no 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 okay well the top tip folks cars don't drive themselves yet so right You know, I was paying attention. Oh, the car slowed down way more than it should have because it was in this unique, probably not unique, but confusing situation. Vehicle in front slows down, but you're at a Y, a a Y of a road. So it gets confused. Like, oh, are you going this way? this way? I've encountered that before with, with some newer vehicles. They, they can sometimes tend to get, to get, get a little confused. I mean, that's why there is that happened. And I, and the solution, I didn't turn anything off. I didn't do anything. I just put my foot down on the throttle and it was like, oh, you just want more gas. And that was it. Like, okay. oh. I don't, if I asked my wife, I don't even know if that she noticed um, what was going on. So, well, well maybe yeah. I'll have to give Civic um, a closer look. Maybe I'll try to go over this weekend to the local dealership that I can't stand and see if they have anything in there. Give it a look, give it a drive. But it's, you know, it's, the, it's an inter- the, it's an inter- interesting take that what you have. Um, I'm I'm glad that you had the chance to drive it. And folks, I know I know what Bruce did that he can't talk about yet. Yeah. And I can't wait for you to find out what he did because I think it's fascinating and cool as hell. Um, yeah, it's it. I can talk about it on the 21st, which is Monday. So next week we'll do a little segment on it. Cause I've got some videos and some pictures and stuff and it's interesting and you know, maybe you'll like it. Maybe you won't. It's kind of tech based. I can say that. Um, but you know, I can talk about it then, but it, yeah, it was a fun weekend. It was, it was fun to do. And I'm glad I got to drive this vehicle because you know, anyone who listens to this show, they know I, you and I, we don't usually get press vehicles. Right. You got you know, the Mustang Mach-E a little bit ago. I got this, but before then, it's been a while. So it's always interesting to drive something that's new and to kind of rejigger your feelings about where vehicles are. Right. And the fact is, like, my buddy in high school had an 84 Civic. I graduated in 2004. He had an 84 Civic. Like, Trust me, compared to an 84 <laughs> and a 2022, they've come a long way. Like, oh, yeah. there's nothing. Com- like, this does not feel like an entry level car. This does oh, not no. feel like, you know, you, f- kid's first car to me. Like, yep. the like I said, the leather was nice. The trim quality was nice. The, the steering was nice. It It's not going to throw you back in your seat, but there was plenty acceleration on the highway. 
Like I, I never felt, Oh my God, I, I'm not going to be able to get out of this. You, you know, you just put your foot down and you go. Well, that's, that has the same, I think it has the same powertrain as the previous generation civic. And I did drive that. Um, and I was totally impressed. I mean, that, that had, I think that's the 1.5 with a CVT, right? Yep. Yep. And, and I was totally impressed with that. Yeah. It's, it's not going to, it's not going to be smoking anybody in a stoplight race, but and it if also you want get, that the SI it, it, exists, the type R exists. Like yep. there are ways to go. It's just, that's that, not what this is for. But I think that powertrain combo with the CVT and I know enthusiasts, oh, CVT. Realist, realistically speaking, if you can keep an engine in its sweet spot and just hold it right there, I mean, that's that's like the best way to do it because you're you're just constantly at that power peak. So this car with the way the CVT was tuned, I, I felt like it, it doesn't just get out of its way. I mean, it it, it has a, it has a little bit of push behind it. So, yeah. um, I and think that the would thing be is, is suitable that, for a lot of people. Yeah. It, it, if you don't like the CVT and I can understand people out there that don't, then there are other options out there, but also this isn't despite, I guess the name sport touring Honda is not selling this as the performance model. Like I just said, they've got the SI, they've got the Integra, they've got the type R. This is the very, very nice civic. And if you take it by that measure, it's nice. Like, I would be hard-pressed to kind of complain about it other than, like I said, it doesn't fit my family. It doesn't fit, fit the size needs of my family. But Works good no, if, you, if you don't have a Corgi. No, it, no Civics yeah. and Corgis. Evidently not, yeah. No like, Civics and Corgis. I'm still going to reserve judgment on the styling. I, I still think it looks a little bland. But I do need to see one in person. Folks, what do you think? You know what to do. Email us at podcast at motorone.com. Go and comment on our article. It goes up every Friday at motorone.com. Go to our YouTube channel, Motor One Podcast. Comment on the videos there. Bruce is going to talk more about his Honda adventure next week. And you definitely want to tune in for that. Yep. We also, we also, we also have something in the works for. Fingers crossed. Two two weeks from now, um, our podcast is going to air on April first. So I'm not going to say that we're just going to like totally mess things up, but we are working on some stuff, and hopefully it's going to be a good time. So just a little teaser there to keep that in mind. Uh, right. Bruce, is is there it's, anything else that we missed? Let me tell. So here's what we're. Fingers crossed, hoping for the April Fools, the April 1st edition. It's not going to be a goof, like Smith said. Nope. But we're ho we are hoping to do a different format than we usually do if everything works out right. So yep. again, no promises, but we're working on it. We'll, we'll have we'll have news. a little different. We'll have some news. We'll have just some really good fun content to talk about. Yeah. It, it's gonna be rambling about cars. Yes. But yeah. but it's gonna be it's gonna be hopefully a little funner yeah that's the hope and um, hopefully i'm not like fighting a sneeze the whole time oh my god this is <laughs> this has been horrible i would much rather hiccup constantly at least i can sit here and hit mute and then when yeah, i need okay, to talk just yeah. jump in and talk really quick in between hiccups so all right well as always good afternoon good evening or good night we appreciate all of our comments we appreciate all of our subscribers all of our followers everyone who watches the show we love it um just a quick update we've been doing uh the show's been like we've been gaining subscribers and gaining mm -hmm. views so we thank all of you new folks and you know feel free to email us it's podcast at motor one.com is the email address or if you don't feel comfortable doing that comment on either the post that goes up on motor one.com or on the youtube video or you know whatever you need to do um but yeah we would love to hear from you especially if you're a new listener we you got a question you got a comment whatever you as you can see we read them so we, we see them, we so. read them and we appreciate it yeah all right well that'll do it for this evening and thanks everybody bye bye Bye-bye now.